thanks for coming, everybody. Most of you probably know who I am. I'm John Foster. I'm a reference librarian at Mentor Public Library. I have a PhD in history. The thing I'm here to talk about is Dunkirk, basically, and the things surrounding Dunkirk. Dunkirk was this incredible moment when, after the German invasion of the Low Countries, Belgium and, and Holland, and then France, I mean, they really were going, they, they didn't really necessarily want to go to Belgium and, and Holland, but, but they did anyway. And in fact, when they got to Leuven, Leuven in uh, Belgium, they burnt the university library, which they had actually done in 1914, when they were there the last time. But the British Expeditionary Force, numbering uh, more than 400,000 men, ended up getting cut off in the northern part of France. And the story that, that, that we're here to tell today is how it is that a large proportion of them managed to get back to the UK, managed to get back to England, and changed what could have been one of the most catastrophic defeats of the war, and one that, that could very easily have, have, have ended the war right there, into not quite a victory, as we'll see, but not a defeat, which was kind of the best that could happen at that point. So the prelude to this, here we see at the end of September 1938, the French Prime Minister Edouard de Ladier at Munich, there you can see Hitler and Mussolini and Mussolini's son Count Chano, who he eventually had executed, but that's another story. Here you see de Ladier backed by some German generals and shaking hands with the German foreign, foreign minister uh, Joachim von Ribbentrop, a uh, former champagne salesman. De Ladier then after they had essentially sold out the Czechs, Hitler had demanded that the Sudetenland, in which there were a lot of ethnic Germans, be given to Germany at the, you know, and threatened to sort of to, to attack them, if not. Neville Chamberlain, who always looks sort of like a, a mid-level insurance executive, went to conference at Munich with the Ladier, with Mussolini, with Hitler, to negotiate a settlement and essentially sold the Czechs down the river gave Hitler exactly what he wanted. Chamberlain flies back to England, uh, gives a speech when he gets back in which he says, I've, I've, you know, we will have peace in our time. Uh, one of the most uh, devastatingly ironic public statements uh, ever made. De Ladier was flying, flew back to France, and he was coming in to land at Le Bourget, the airfield outside of Paris where Charles Lindbergh had landed in his transatlantic flight. And he saw a large crowd of people, and he was actually afraid that they were there to lynch him because he had participated in selling out the, the checks in this way. But they landed, and it turned out that they were there to sort of celebrate that there was going to be peace, that there wouldn't be war. And he turned to one of his associates and said, my quel con, which uh, uh, means sort of loosely translated, what a bunch of jerks. Um, because he, you know, he knew what had happened. Right? He knew what it meant. He was a, de Ladier was a canny politician. By the way, my, my French-speaking mother pointed out to me that my calcon, as, as what a bunch of jerks, is a sort of family-friendly translation of that. Uh, con is, has a much ruder meaning in France, which uh, in deference to your, your tender ears, I will not translate. But what he said was not very nice. But Deladier once again understood that this wasn't the, you know, the end of the situation. Hitler wasn't going to be satisfied with, with this. And if you're French, right, and had lived through 1914 to 1918, that's the kind of thing that makes you kind of nervous, right? Because the Germans and the French share a very long border. So Winston Churchill, many of you may know, had had this very checkered career during the First World War. He had been First Lord of the Admiralty. He had organized the landings at Gallipoli on the Dardanelles in 1915, which had turned out to be a catastrophic failure, and which had essentially, you know, he had been sort of made to fall on his sword. After that, he had been made to, to resign from the government. He went and, and actually joined the military, served in France. Uh, there's a picture, which I didn't stick in here, but which I could have, of him standing around. He had a, like a French poilu. French soldiers are referred to as poilu, which means hairy ones. Um, weirdly enough. It's, it's basically the sort of French, the way we call soldiers GIs. But he had a Poilu's helm, like helmet, steel helmet, and he used to wear that around. He had been in the wilderness for a lot of the interwar period. He had sort of fallen out with the conservative leadership. He was a member of the Tory party. Uh, he had joined the, the liberals, which really put him in bad odor with the Tory party. Uh, and then he had sort of switched back. He spent a lot of the interwar period writing, he was a member of parliament, but he was, not in, he was not very influential. 
But starting with the rise of Hitler to power in 1933, he was more aware than a lot of people, or he was more attuned than a lot of people to the, the, the dangers that Hitler presented. And he was constantly trying to get the British government, at that point under Stanley Baldwin, which was a Tory, he was the leader of the Tory party, uh, to, to rearm. But their view was, well, that's a continental problem. The British have this very jaundiced view about the continents. In uh, William Manchester's biography of Winston Churchill, he notes that at one, there was a, at one point a headline in, the British, in one of the British newspapers that was said, fog in the English Channel, the continent isolated. As if, as if the continent was sort of the backwater and, and, and England was the, the sort of place where things were really going on. Churchill had always been of a sort of literary cast of mind. He came from the sort of poorer branch of the Marlborough family. The, the richer branch was, was, was very rich and very well, very renowned. Uh, his ancestor, the Duke of Marlborough, had been uh, one of the great generals in the 18th century British Empire. He had sort of joined the army because he couldn't really do anything else. His father was a, was a, was a, very, was a major politician uh, who died relatively young because he got syphilis, I think. Um, he and his father didn't really get along. He, he idolized his father. His father was very cold to him. So was his mother. He was half American. His mother was, was American. And this also put him kind of out of order with, uh, with a lot of people in the British, in British public life. But he, you know, he used to do these things like he, when he heard the sort of uh, invasion of Cuba was going to happen, he got himself assigned there to be a journalist and wrote about it because he needed the money. He was in the cavalry, by the way, and this just then I'll move on to sort of more relevant matters, but being in the cavalry costs a lot of money in the British Army in the late 19th, early 20th century because you had to supply your own horses. They didn't, they didn't give you horses if you were a cavalry officer, and especially if you were a polo player, which he was. So you have to have two or three horses, and it's, they're not cheap, and you have to have a guy, you know, you have to get them stabled, and etc. So he was constantly sort of getting himself ass assigned to these sort of places where he could do journalistic work to make st some extra money. But he was mostly sort of out of favor, and a lot of people really held him in very low regard, a lot of people in the Tory party, in his own political party. He began to be rehabilitated in, starting in 1937. Neville Chamberlain became the Prime Minister, replaced Stanley Baldwin. He's eventually appointed First Lord of the Admiralty, which is a real, you know, quite a remarkable achievement given the unfortunate circumstances under which he had stopped being First Lord of the Admiralty uh, in 1915. He was a very vocal critic of appeasement, and he really had no time for people who wanted to give in to Hitler at all. He, he saw very early what Hitler was all about and, and, wanted to, and, and wanted to try and get the British government to, to rearm. He had a sort of intelligence network. His neighbor was a government official and was sort of like giving him access to government documents. So he knew what the British government really knew about Hitler and he, it made him... Now, there were certain things he couldn't say in public because they would be like, well, how do you know that? But September 1939, Germany invades... Poland. Hitler invades Poland. The Soviet Union essentially does it at the same time. Hitler and Stalin had, had signed this agreement, the substance of which was they wouldn't attack each other, but they were going to dismember Poland. And this is, you know, just to, sort of as an aside, I guess, in the long history of things that go on in Central Europe, like Poland getting dismembered is a, is a kind of recurring theme. Like the, the powers around it, Russia, Prussia, and um, the Habsburg Empire, had on numerous occasions taken some or all of Poland. That was, that was really the only thing that most of them could agree on, was that Poland should be pulled apart and given to other people. What follows in the German invasion is a wave of incredible brutality. The Germans and the Soviets begin mass murdering educated Poles. The Germans then start in on the Jews, but the, interestingly, although the, the Germans, the Nazis did murder uh, probably three million Polish Jews. They started on the Polish intelligentsia first because their idea about Poland was that it was going to be that it was going to be depopulated and made into sort of farmland for for these sort of Aryan soldier farmers in the wake of the wars. But interestingly, and and then I really will get down to business. I'm sorry, I know too many things. Auschwitz, before it became a concentration camp, was originally intended by Himmler to be a sort of like model colony. Like, you know, where they would clear out all the Polish people, plant sort of German farmers on the land. And uh, 
But then he got sort of bureaucratically, someone, you know, he got kind of bureaucratically outsmarted by, by someone else, and, and he had to sort of reconfigure it. And then the rest is quite unfortunately history. The first British involvement in the war was an attempt to prevent the Germans from taking Norway. And the reason why was because, not so much because they were interested in what happened in Norway, but because the Sweden was the largest supplier of iron ore to uh, Germany, and they wanted to, to try and disrupt that. But the, the Norwegian campaign turned out to be a failure. This was another Winston Churchill special. And Churchill, if you follow his career throughout the war, he's constantly suggesting, well, we need to go back into Norway, to the point that Sir Alan Brooke, who eventually was the, ch the chief of the Imperial General Staff, you know, Brooke kept diaries. I really, if you're really, if you're interested in, in how the sort of British thought about the war, Sir Alan Brooke's diaries, war diaries, are, are, have been published. And Brooke was constantly just like, oh, God. Again, with the Northern Norway thing, can we just, that's an idiotic idea. Winston needs to drop it. But it just, it comes up, it's like, a, you know, Churchill was like a broken record. When he got, when he got hooked up on it, he just wouldn't let it go. On 10th of May, 1940, Germany invaded Belgium and Holland and, and France. By that time, it was clear that Chamberlain's policy of appeasement had failed catastrophically. And Chamberlain, who had been a lame duck for, uh, for the best part of a year, after the Germans had invaded Poland, finally resigned. The king, you know, he apologized to the king, or he passed his resignation to the king. The king said, well, I, you know, I feel like you've been treated really horribly. And then they were like, well, who is going to be prime minister? They had some other candidates, but none of them were acceptable to the Labour Party. So Churchill was the kind of, uh, Churchill was the sort of least worst option. He was the option that nobody hated enough to stop. So he was brought in. He was in very bad odor with the king at that point. And the reason was, uh, as I was sort of the story I was telling kind of before everybody got here about Edward VIII, the king's older brother, had, had insisted on marrying this American socialite, this very horrible woman, Wallace Simpson, and was forced to abdicate because she was an American and a divorcee, which made her a two-time loser as far as the, the British monarchist circles were concerned. Churchill had tried very hard to keep her from to keep him, to keep Edward from having to abdicate. And George, his younger brother, who became George VI, really held that against him. And it was, it was some time before uh, George really reconciled himself to, to Churchill being, being the guy. So there's two funny things here. I, I love these kind of goofy history things. Um, the first one was that, so Churchill had to give his first address to the country over the radio, he had to give it, and he, the, here's the funny thing about Churchill. So he was used to speaking in the House of Commons, and if you've ever seen the House of Commons, the way speaking is done in the House of Commons, you're not speaking from like some high place, you're actually down on the floor in a sort of like low sort of place. And Churchill was used to sort of wheeling his head back and forth because you've got you know, to be, be speaking to everybody in the House of Commons. But of course that does not work on the radio. So one of the, they brought in one of the actors from the old Vic, and he stood behind Churchill and held his ears to keep him from swinging his head back and forth while he spoke. On the 13th, he addressed the House of Commons. This is May 13th, 1940. And this is really one of the more remarkable speeches. I'll just read a small amount of it. He said, to form an administration on the scale that we're doing in this scale and complexity is a serious undertaking in itself, but it must be remembered that we are in the preliminary stages of one of the greatest battles in history. So at this point, the Germans are, uh, are across the French frontier. They're into, into Belgium through Holland. Uh, they've severely bombed Rotterdam, killed many civilians. We are in the preliminary stage of one of the greatest battles in history. We are in action on many other points, in Norway and in Holland, that we have to be prepared in the Mediterranean, that the air battle is continuous, and that many preparations, such as have been indicated by my honorable friend below the gangway, have to be made here at home. In this crisis, I hope I may be pardoned if I do not address the House at any length today. I hope that any of my friends and colleagues, or former colleagues, who are affected by the political reconstruction will make allowance, all allowance, for any lack of ceremony with which it has been necessary to act. I would say to the House, as I have said to those who have joined this government, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many long months of struggle and suffering. You ask, what is our policy? 
I can say, it is to wage war by sea, land, and air, with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us, to wage a war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalog of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word. It is victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory, however long and hard the road may be, for without victory there is no survival. Let that be realized. No survival for the British Empire. No survival for all that the British Empire has stood for. No survival for the urgent impulse of the ages that mankind will move forward toward its goal. But I take up my task with buoyancy and hope. I feel sure that our cause will not be suffered to fail among men. At this time, I feel entitled to claim the aid of all, and I say, come then, let us go forward together with our united strength. It was this rapturous moment in the House of Commons. People were sort of very worried about what was going to happen. You know, there was still a sort of fear about the Great War, the 1914 to 1918 war, with its horrific casualties and indecisive battles was still in everybody's mind. And there was a fear that people were not going to be able to stand up to Hitler. There were even people still in the British government who said, well, let's negotiate with Hitler. And this was Churchill making absolutely 100% clear that they were not going to negotiate with Hitler full stop, that that was the policy of the British government was not going to be to negotiate, it was going to be to resist and to fight back. France, unfortunately, was in a parlous state. And part of the reason was that the French had what was reputed to be the strongest army in Europe. But the French political class was dysfunctional to an extreme. There was a very extreme conservative movement who were monarchists, wanted to see the monarchy brought back. They were, uh, there were organizations like the quite a few, the, the uh, Cross of Fire, who, was, who were sort of like right-wing paramilitaries almost. And they had a very wrong strategy. I don't know why I included this, but it was based on this, the Maginot Line, which had been constructed in the 30s and which ran from the Swiss border all the way up to the, the southern part of the border with Belgium. And this is the border with Germany along here. You can see uh, Luxembourg there, but the Germans really didn't make too much, were too worried about that. Why didn't they extend it further north, you might ask? The reason was that they were afraid that the Belgians would view that as in some way aggressive, as in some way uh, hostile. So their idea was, we'll have this long fortification. Also, there was the Ardennes Forest. And the French were convinced that the Germans could not move effectively through the Ardennes Forest, especially with their tanks. This turned out to be a massive miscalculation, and one which they had no business making, because uh, the Germans had war-gamed moving tanks through forested areas in the Black Forest, 1936. Uh, also, at a certain point, the uh, French had captured a German military courier who actually had the attack plans on him, but they were convinced that this couldn't really be what they were gonna do. So the Maginot Line, it's this, it's really incredible fortification. Here's a sort of gun in place when you can see in sort of uh, rotating turret. There's the sort of backside, you can see the turrets facing forward. Here are some of the concrete emplacements. Uh, and then these are anti-tank barriers. And it might have worked if what had been about to happen was the First World War. And this, you know, those, everybody here is, I'm sure, familiar with that sort of uh, old adage about armies are constantly preparing to fight the last war. And in this case, it was very true. The French said, well, you know, the Germans came across in, in 1914, and the only reason they didn't take Paris was because of what's called the miracle on the Marne when the, the French, you know, made a stand. But, so we're going to prevent that from happening. Uh, this is a sort of cutaway drawing of what one of these Maginot line emplacements look like. They have like all sorts of uh, storerooms, supply rooms. You can see gun emplacements. There's even a gun emplacement on the back in case they get behind you. There are workshops. There's the entrance down in the way bottom back on the sort of uh, on the, in the lee of the hill. There's a little mine emplacement there in case the Germans get in the sort of first part, you can blow the tunnels. But the, the French had also, the divisions that they had put there were mostly composed of 
green troops and, and married men because they assumed that they could put less qualified troops there. Why? Because they had this incredible fortification. The British had also planned for what might happen if they invaded. And here are sort of three lines that they had thought that they might defend. This is the Albert Canal, which uh, is centered on the fortress at Ebenemel, which is the greatest, the sort of central fortress in the, in the uh, Belgian defenses. That's Maastricht right there, so that's where Holland starts. But, and then they thought, well, we might you know, make a line here around the French border. But what they had settled on was the Deal River. The, the plan for going there was referred to as Plan D. So the theory was, if the Germans attack, what we'll do, what the, the British Expeditionary Force and the French arm, one, one of the French armies will do, is advance to the, to the deal and meet them there, right? So we can fight the battle in Belgium, not in France. The French were really, thought that was a fabulous idea. Because they had seen the destruction of the First World War and they didn't want that happening in their, in their area again. Yes? Where did the Germans come in? Just Belgium or Holland? Or? All over. We'll get to that. And as a matter of fact, this is how they came in. So they attacked at the sector in Sedan. So this is Sedan. It was a very famous French city because it's where the Germans defeated the French in, in the Franco-Prussian War of 1871. Uh, this is Verdun, where one of the great, somewhat decisive battles of the First World War had been fought. But anyway, uh, so the British, or the Germans, the Nazis, 12th and 15th armies come attacking through here. But then they also, and here's the Ardennes, so they assume that, that nothing could get through the Ardennes forest, which it could. That they assumed that it would take the Germans 15 days to get through the Ardennes forest. It took them two. And here is the sort of line that the British Expeditionary Force and the French took up. Well, they had an easy time getting there, and it might have occurred to them why, to ask why it was. And the reason was because the Germans wanted them there. Because the Germans knew that they could come through here, and this was their plan. So when they broke through at Sedan, they ripped about a 60-mile gap in the French lines at Sedan. So they could have then gone directly to Paris. By the way, another piece of French military planning, of bad French military planning, was they thought, well, OK, the Germans, they've got these tanks, right? But tanks don't get great gas mileage. So eventually, they're going to have to stop, right? They're going to have to stop and refuel. But what had changed between 1918 and 1939, 1940? Lots more people had cars. And as a result, I mean, what do you have to have if you have lots of people with cars? You have to have gas stations. And so all over northeastern France, there were these gas stations. And the German tanks just pulled up, loaded up, and drove on down the road. And this was a real shock to the French. I mean, I don't know why they didn't consider that this might happen, but... The French commander at that point was a general named Gamelin. Here are some of the main characters. This is Lord Gort, who's the head of the, the British Expeditionary Force, Jack to his friends. He came from a, from a, uh, a very well-established British military family. He was not really very well thought of by his colleagues. One of his colleagues said that he would be good as a divisional commander, but, but that leading an army was, was he, he didn't have the skills for it. This is General Sir Alan Brooke, later Lord Alan Brooke. He was the head of one of the two corps of Gort's army. He eventually was brought, after this, was brought back to England and made the commander of the Imperial General Staff. Uh, and he was very heavily involved in planning Overlord, the D-Day invasion, and, and, and practically all the, all the sort of things that the British did in the course of the war. Uh, there's Gort again talking to General Georges, the head of the sort of northern department of the French army. And here's Gamelin. And Gamelin became convinced almost immediately that the French had lost. On the morning of the 15th, uh, Churchill was awakened by a phone call from Paul Renault, the, the French prime minister. Renault spoke to him in English. We've been defeated. We're beaten. We've lost the battle. Churchill was momentarily confused, but also was thinking of the, the 1914 to 18, the First World War. He was like, no, 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 stay calm. Like, eventually things will, things will, you know, the attack will peter out and you'll be able to sort of whatever. He said, surely it cannot have happened so soon. 
Renault said. The front is broken near Sedan. They are pouring through in great numbers with tanks and armored cars. Churchill said, All experience shows that the offensive will come to an end after a while. Within five or six days, they'll have to halt for supplies. Renault repeated, We are defeated. We have lost the battle. Churchill said he would come over and, and, and have a talk. So he flew over with Edward Ironside, Edmund Ironside, the head of the, who at that point was the chief of the Imperial General Staff, with Jacques Colville, his private secretary, and with, I think, Pug Ismay too. Pug Ismay was the liaison between the government and the, and the, and the British military. And uh, so they have this meeting at the French government offices, and Ironside said that, you know, they had been there before and it was pretty nice, but he was looking down in the garden and what he saw was a series of bonfires because the French were burning all their official papers because they were so convinced that the Germans were going to get there. So Churchill tried to sort of buck them up, you know, like, don't worry, we'll fight with you. The, the attack will peter out, we'll stop. He asked Gamelan, so Churchill only kind of spoke French. So it's, you have to imagine like a, a sort of 69-year-old British man saying what I'm about to say. But he, he went to Gamelan, the French general, and said, Où est la masse de manoeuvre? Where's your, mass of, where's, your, where's your reserve force? And Gamelan just looked at him and said, Aucun, there isn't any. And Churchill was dumbfounded because he couldn't imagine that you would be, you know, defending a line hundreds of miles long and you wouldn't have strategic reserve because there's, it's, there's almost certain to be a breakthrough somewhere, right? You need to have strategic reserve so that you can send troops to stop it. And Churchill was absolutely shocked by this. At this point, in the north, it gets mostly stabilized. Once again, here's the deal. And the, the Belgians are fighting uh, on this wing, the French are fighting on this wing, and then the BEF is here in the middle. Here are the Belgians. Here's the French First Army. Um, but you can see this gigantic bulge that's formed, and that's where the Germans have, have advanced almost to Beaumont, um, uh, all the way past Montcarnet. And so Gamelin issues an order, and I'm going to... This is another funny thing. The, the, sorry, I, had, I have to go back because I forgot this funny story. What Reynaud and the French generals wanted was for the British to send over more fighter squadrons to help them fight the battle. Although the French Air Force was quite large, and there was a big uh, inquest afterward about why it, you know, why it, didn't, why it wasn't brought to bear. But the, the British already had, I think, four fighter squadrons in country, and they, but they only had 10 back in England, and, and Churchill made the point well, if we send all our fighters over here and they get destroyed, because what the, what the French wanted was them f for the fighters to help fight the tanks. But Churchill made the point, and this is really right, fighters aren't, fighter airplanes aren't good for fighting tanks. You need artillery for that. That's, that's the ideal. Like, you know, and, and he said also, you know, we can use these planes to bomb bridges, right? But bridges can be rebuilt. But if our fighter crews get, if our air crews get shot down, Though they're not replaceable in the same way. But finally, so he arranged to have four more sent over. And he, went, he wanted to deliver, deliver the message personally. So he went to find Renault. It was late at night. And he went to the Quai d'Orsay, the, the sort of French governmental center. But Renault wasn't there. And they couldn't find him. And finally, someone came up with the fact that he was, he was at his mistress's apartment. The Madame de la, uh, Madame la Comtesse de Port. Uh, she was a, a, a very sort of prominent figure and he was kind of hiding out from his wife at her apartment. Um, so anyway, Churchill, uh, he, he liked to give gifts, you know, it was sort of Christmas day for him, and he went to, in the middle of the night, to, the, to her apartment and knocked on the door, and, and Renault came out. And, and then they uh, sent for the foreign minister, too. They sent for the foreign minister, who by that point was Deladier. Deladier was also with his mistress. Also, Deladier and Renault hated each other. This was part of the dysfunction of the French political class. But he got them together in, in the Comtesse de Port's living room and told them, we're sending you four more fighter squadrons. And they were very grateful. But what a weird scene that must have been. Like, you know, I have to chase down these two French, like two main French politicians in the middle of a war. And, and, and this is where they're camped out. So then, this is, this is May 19th. May 19th is when he gives the uh, address, by the way, where the guy from the Old Vic had to hold him by the ears and keep his head straight. I speak to you for the first time as Prime Minister, he says, on, this is on the 19th on his return to England. In a solemn hour for the life of our country, of our empire, of our allies, and above all, the cause of freedom. A tremendous battle is raging in France and Flanders. 
The Germans, by a remarkable combination of air bombing and heavily armored tanks, have broken through the French defenses north of the Maginot Line, and, along, and strong columns of their armored vehicles are ravaging the open country, which for the first day or two was without defenders. Side by side, the British and French peoples have advanced to rescue not only Europe, but mankind from the foulest and most soul-destroying tyranny which has ever darkened and stained the pages of history. Tell us what you really think about the Nazis. Behind them, behind the armies and fleets of Britain and France, gather a group of shattered states and bludgeoned races, the Czechs, the Poles, the Norwegians, the Danes, the Dutch, the Belgians, upon all of whom the long night of barbarism will descend, unbroken even by a star of hope, unless we conquer, as conquer we must, as conquer we shall. So Churchill just had a way of, of rising to these moments. And, you know, when people heard this on the radio, they really, you know, took up this idea that, that they were going to resist, that they weren't going to, that they weren't going to concede. Finally, on Sunday the 19th, uh, Gamelan issues order number 12. And order number 12 is, calls for this. The BEF will attack south, and the French armies below the bulge will attack north. They'll cut off the German bulge. This sounded like a great idea. Who knows? Because almost immediately, Gamelan was, was relieved of command. The French government had, had decided that he was uh, not conducting the war correctly. You can kind of see, by this point, this is what's happened. Sorry, this is the updated, this is 21st of May. So the Germans have made it to Abbeville. They've cut France in two. So the idea is, once again, the BEF will attack this way. The French armies will kick off on the Somme and attack north, and they'll, uh, they'll pinch out the German bulge, destroy their armor. So the French appoint General Vagon. Vagon is a political general. He's never commanded troops in battle. He was uh, stationed in Syria, so he had to fly several hours back. The first thing he did when he got there was to cancel order number 12. The second thing he did was to go take a nap because he was, old. I think he was 75. Once again, he was a political general. He was very hooked into the far right scene. He was associated with the quite a few. When you have Nazis invading the country, it's probably not a great idea to give the job of fighting them off to somebody who's kind of Nazi adjacent, which is, which is a little bit what Vagon was. So this is the makeup of the BEF. John Vereker, Lord Gort, Viscount Gort, Jack to his friends. One corps under General Barker, two corps under Alan Brook, and the third under General Sir Robert Adam. So the problem is that the Vagon plan, as it came to be called, was a fantasy. At no point did the French army south of the bulge start to move to attack. And so Gort is in this situation where a couple of things, bad things are happening. He knows that the Germans have gotten to Abbeville. He knows that they've been pushed back across the Belgian frontier with the result that the Belgians are now at the point of surrendering. The Belgian army was definitely not interested in fighting if they were not going to be fighting in Belgium. And the morale of the French First Army was also very low. At a certain point, uh, Ironside went to the First Army headquarters and found everyone sort of wandering around listlessly. Uh, très fatigué, he said. Everyone very tired, nothing doing. And he said he got so annoyed at the, at the French general that he grabbed him by the lapels and started shaking him to try and get him to, to take some positive action. But the, 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 they were so sort of like emotionally defeated. So Gord has been instructed by Ironside, by the British government, you're not to retreat to the channel ports because they were afraid that if they had retreated, these are the ports that, that the sort of first line of defense of England and traditionally the sort of points of jump off for transit between uh, England, which is just across the, the Pas de Calais over here. So uh, Calais, Graveline, Dunkirk, Newport, Ostend. But he's been told, don't go, you're, not to, you're, you're under no circumstances to retreat to the channel ports because they'll, they'll bottle you up there and it'll just be a, like a bomb shop. Like you'll just get, you'll get wiped out. But Gord is then told by Brooke that the Belgian army is disintegrating. So his left flank is now going away. And he has serious concerns about the French on, the, on, uh, on his right. By this point, Ironside is convinced that the BEF is done for. 
that they're going to lose 400,000 men and all their arms and equipment. At a certain point, he, you know, he writes in his diary, I met with Churchill, and Churchill asked me what I thought was likely to happen to the BEF, and I told him that I thought that it was very unlikely that any of them were coming back, and Churchill did not criticize me for being too pessimistic. So around the 20th, a couple of things happen. First of all, the German army stops. And the reasons for this have, have been debated. Hitler ordered them to stop. And Hitler was worried that they were gonna, that they were gonna get strung out. Also, it had been raining, and the German tank commander, Guderian, who would later rise to, Guderian is one of the two great generals of German armor, the other one, most of you probably know, being Erwin Rommel, who was also associated in this. As a matter of fact, got quite a beating from, uh, from the, uh, some of the British Expeditionary Force armor. Oh, also, by the way, I'd forgotten about this. Another bad thing that the French did was, although they had very good tanks relative to the, the tanks that everybody had, uh, armed with 75 millimeter cannons, they had decided that the tanks were a sort of augmentation of infantry which is kind of what they are now. This is actually, for those of you who are interested, one of the big mistakes that the Russians made when they invaded Ukraine was putting like, like unsupported tank columns just rolling around, which you cannot do because a sufficiently motivated 13-year-old can use a Javelin missile and, and just pop all your tanks. And if you want to see the truth of this, it's all over YouTube. You can find film of it. But, um, at that point, the, what the Germans had sort of learned was you needed to mass your tanks into a kind of like a mobile, an armored fist. The, the French tanks operated sort of more spread out, and because they were meant to be an infantry weapon, the French general staff had said, well, they don't need radios. So the French tanks did not have radios in them, so they couldn't communicate with each other. Because really, they were supposed to only be communicating with the infantrymen around them. This had catastrophic effects of the kind that you can probably guess at without needing to have it explained. Yes? What were the size of the armies against each other? The BEF was about 400,000 men. The Germans had, I believe, 18 divisions, so they had something on the order of uh, a million. The French probably had a roughly similar amount, but the, the French dispositions were so bad I mean, once the breakthrough happened at Sedan, which they had just never accounted for, once, once the breakthrough happens through the Ardennes, then the French become, um, they get into this sort of like fugue state where they just can't defend themselves. And even though, I mean, this is the thing that Churchill kept thinking, like, okay, they have like lots and lots of men in the southern part of France. And, and, and when the British Expeditionary Force got off, as we'll see in a few minutes, the plan was that they were going to be reintroduced into southern France because... They had assessed, in a way that should have been correct, that the French should have enough men and material to fight this fight. But the French became so demoralized that they just broke apart. At a certain, part, at a certain point, Brooke calls Gort to say, look, the French First Army has now disintegrated, uh, and there's a gigantic gap on my right which the Germans have not seen yet. But as soon as they do, they're going to head straight through it. We need to do something. We need to do something now. So Gort takes one of the canniest decisions, one of the most necessary decisions on his own recognizance taken during the entire war. He decides that, contrary to what he's been instructed, he's going to retreat to the channel ports. He's going to trade space for time. Napoleon once said, uh, on the battlefield, space can be recovered, but time cannot. Yes. Montgomery, uh, yes, was involved in the BEF, was not at the sort of level that he would become like that. He only really sort of got to the sort of top level in British, the British military during the North Africa campaign, 1943. He was a very odd duck. He was another one of these guys, like he was a vegetarian and a non-smoker, and both those things were very unusual among British military people, but that, that's another story. So, so Gort decides, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna trade space for time here. We're going to retreat to the channel ports while we can still get to Dunkirk. Churchill has the, the army send over two new divisions to Calais. When the retreat starts to happen around the 20th of May, the Germans get, first get to Boulogne, then they uh, get to Calais. And 
Churchill and the Imperial General Staff realize that the Calais garrison is going to have to make a stand. They've been there only a few days, but they can't be pulled out, and if they retreat, the Germans will get to the channel ports first. So he tells, he has, I think Ironside, tell the commander at Calais, no, it was Anthony Eden, the foreign secretary, told the commander at Calais, your instructions are to fight to the last man. Like you, you know, you have to be sacrificed. There's no other way to do it. And it was a devastating decision. I mean, Eden says to, to C.N. Nicholson, the, the commander of the Rifle Brigade, the eyes of the empire are upon you, or upon the defense of Calais, and His Majesty's government are confident that you and your gallant regiments will perform an exploit worthy of the British name. Churchill knew it was happening, he said later. He didn't talk during dinner, which was very unusual. Churchill was, was usually very voluble, and he said uh, in, his, in his memoirs, one has to eat and drink during war, but I could not help feeling sick as we afterwards sat silently eating at the table because he knew that that, that was it for those guys. Like the, they were, at, at best, they were going to be captured, but m probably most of them were going to be killed, which is what happened. So what we have is the situation beginning on the 26th of May. A week earlier, they had kind of, the British government had kind of cottoned on to what might happen here. By the time, so Gord had been out of contact and he cabled the British government, he had lost contact with them, to tell them what he was doing. In the intervening period, Churchill realized the truth of the situation, which was the BEF had to retreat to the channel ports. And they had start making plans. They had contacted everybody who owned a boat longer than about 15 feet. Uh, in, the southern part of, in the southern part of England. They send over a gentleman named Commander Weymouth to organize things on the beach. And if you watch the Dunkirk movie, which I really recommend, it's really quite entertaining. I thought it was quite entertaining. This is the character that Kenneth Branagh plays under the name of Bolton. But he basically ran the, the situation on the beach and kept it from getting out of control. Here you can see British Tommies like wading out neck deep into the ocean to try and get to these, try and get to these boats. They're constantly being strafed by German aircraft. This is what's called the Eastern Mole. It's a breakwater. Usually these things were made out of stone. This was made out of wood. You can stand about three or four guys abreast on it, and you can see a boat pulled up to it. There were a number of problems associated with this. Number one, tides at Dunkirk run 15 to 20 feet. Also, this wasn't really meant to have boats pulled up next to it, and the, the seas were, were a bit unstable, so that you had to jump from here to here, and if you got it wrong, there was, you were going straight to the bottom, uh, and that was it. But also you have men out here on the beaches, and you have the Germans dropping these leaflets. You, we surround you, surrender and survive, comrades. They have it in French and in, in English. British soldiers, look at this map. It gives you the true, it gives your true situation. The Allied, everybody else. Your troops are entirely surrounded. Stop fighting, put down your arms. This did not get much traction with the British, as you can well imagine. These are Tommies on the beach. You can see an explosion out to sea. You can see the, uh, there's an oil storage facility that had gotten hit and was burning, and that the German fighter aircraft and bombers used as a kind of beacon to bring themselves into the beach. But if you're just sitting there on the beach, and you got, I mean, your chances of like doing any significant damage to a plane overhead, firing a Lee Enfield 308 or whatever it is that they have, um, is pretty limited, but why not? I mean, what else you got going on? At first, they were convinced that they could get about 10,000 men off. But you can kind of see as things go on, on the 27th, they got 7,600 men out of the harbor. On the 28th, they brought 5,300 men off the beaches and 11,800 off the harbor. On the 29th, 13,000 off the beaches and 33,000. And the numbers, start to, the numbers start to go up pretty dramatically. And Churchill and the, the people in the Imperial General Staff realize that they might actually get some significant portion of these guys back to England. And this is really a remarkable thing because they've been convinced that these guys are goners. If you read the diary entries from any of these guys at the time, the, 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 the feeling is, we're doomed. These, these men are doomed. On the 31st of May, 22,900 men get off the beach and another 45,000 get out of, through the harbor. 
By the end, using a combination of British destroyers, nine of which are sunk in the process, and private boats, they managed to get more than 338,000 men, including a large number of French soldiers. Uh, there's, a, there's another point at which, at which Churchill goes over to meet with the French general staff, or the French leadership, and one of them says, well, you know, it's being put around that the British are, are getting preference getting on these boats. And Churchill, who once again could only sort of speak French, was like, no, no, bras de sous, bras de sous. They're going arm in arm. Like he, he wanted it. But the, the, the French were also upset because they thought, well, we had this plan, right? The plan was a fantasy. And Vagon, there's a very good sort of reason to think that Vagon's idea was, well, we'll all, you know, if we're going to go down, the British should go down too. So there's, a, there's, there's good reason to think that his reason for wanting the British as a part of that attack that he wasn't making from the South was that he wanted to sort of draw them into the disaster as well. That 338, is that all British or French? That's about 50,000 French and about 270,000. Did Churchill communicate to the French to change the plan then? He, well, yes, eventually. Uh, so. First of all, when the, when the French discovered what Gord had done, they found, they found out before Churchill did. They called up Churchill and were like, what is going on here? Like, are you guys bugging out? And Churchill found out and he said, well, I don't know what Gord has done. There's probably some good reason for it. We're not bugging out. But then he found out, and, and what he said, what Churchill said to them was like, look, what we're doing here is getting out of a situation where we're trapped, and we're going to reintroduce these troops into the southern part of France for the counterattack. But by this point, the French government is so dysfunctional that they start talking about surrender. As a matter of fact, they have this discussion, which is being run by a guy named Paul Baudouin, who was a protege of Reynaud's mistress, and who was a, a peaser, during which they're talking about how they might have to sign a, a peace. And Churchill keeps saying, you know, je comprends. Like, I understand, meaning, I understand the words that you're saying, not that I agree. And so he leaves, he goes back to the airfield, and he had an interpreter there named Edward Spears, who's an associate of his from the First World War. Spears found out, de Gaulle tells Spears, de Gaulle, who's really the only person who wants to fight anymore, tells Spears, well, Baudouin is giving it around that you said you understand that they might do a separate peace. And Churchill is in sense, he's like, no, it's, je comprends, like, I understand, that's what it means in French, right? And he's like, yeah, and he's like, well, it's going a little far when I actually use the right words to suggest that I meant something completely different by saying them than I, than I obviously did. This meeting, by the way, takes place at the Chateau de, the, the Chateau de Vincennes uh, outside Paris. So uh, here we have de Gaulle, and that's uh, Spears next to him. That is Vega, who one of the British leaders compared, said looked like an elderly jockey. That's Edmund Ironside, the head of the, the chairman, chief of the Imperial General Staff. Uh, that's Reynaud, that's Baudouin. At a certain point, the French government decamps to the, the Loire because they're convinced that Paris is going to get taken. And they have another sort of meeting with Spears and some of the other people. And Spears is going into the meeting. It takes place at about 10 o'clock at night in a sort of prefecture office. And as he's going through the lobby, he's <laughs> he sees de Gaulle sort of hiding behind a potted plant, and de Gaulle kind of horse whispers to him, I think there's a very good chance that I'm going to be arrested, because the appeasement side of the French government was winning, and they had good reason to want to get rid of de Gaulle. So Spears says to him, well, look, meet me at the airport in the morning at the airfield, and, you know, you can come to s as if you're sort of seeing us off, right? And then you can just come with us. But definitely don't go back to your house, right? And uh, so de Gaulle, you know, Spears goes to this meeting and then de Gaulle is gone. And then in the morning, de Gaulle shows up and as the plane starts to move, Spears said, I just put my hands under his, under his arms and dragged him bodily into the plane. He said, I have no idea where he spent the night. He certainly didn't go home because he would have been arrested, almost certainly. Was de Gaulle high up at the time? Yeah, he was, one of the, he was one of the sort of second rank of generals. And he had been brought in by Renault because he was really much more ready to fight. But by that point, the, the, the French armies were disintegrating. Uh, and so Pétain, who had been brought in as a sort of overleader, Pétain was a very famous French general. He had been the victor at Verdun. 
but uh, he was old, and he thought that they might as well just try and come to some agreement with the Germans. So de Gaulle reasoned correctly <laughs> that once those people really got into power, he was going to be a fly in the ointment, and, and he needed to get... De Gaulle's an interesting character, too, by the way. Like, if you read the sort of history of the Second World War, <laughs> Roosevelt absolutely hated him, just couldn't stand him. Refused until, I think, I don't, I don't think that Churchill, I don't think Roosevelt ever acknowledged that he was the leader of, of, the, of the French, you know, the French Committee of National Liberation. And Churchill didn't like him much either, but Churchill at least understood that he was the guy. I mean, that's, that's basically it. But, but yeah, so at one point, in, I think this is in 1940, late 43 or 44, Churchill says, well, you should bring him to Washington and, and you know, meet him just to sort of show that, you know, as a sort of gesture of support. And Roosevelt said, I'll do it, but only if he asks, because I don't want anyone to say that I ever invited him anywhere. Um, like Roosevelt. It's funny, too, because Roosevelt was a pretty get-along kind of guy. Like, he really, he really was a... I mean, this was the, the problem with Roosevelt vis-a-vis -vis Stalin and Churchill. Roosevelt thought that, you know, Stalin was, as he said, get addable. Like that he could, you know, if he could just talk man to man to Stalin and sort of do his backslappy thing, he could convince Stalin to, to be a good guy or whatever. Churchill understood Stalin, right? He understood you couldn't trust him any farther than you could throw him. But Churchill also knew this about Stalin. Once you knew what he wanted, then you could predict what he was going to do. He was, he, was very, he was not unpredictable. He just, you couldn't trust the things that he said. But once you knew the things that he wanted, then you could be pretty... So at a certain point, I think this is at the Tehran conference, they're just sort of discussing Poland. And it becomes clear that, that Stalin wants like the eastern 150 miles of Poland. And Churchill says, well, okay, here, why don't we just... We'll just shift Poland over 150 miles and we'll take that out of Germany. Because he knew the alternative was, you know, going to war over Poland, which he didn't think they could do and wasn't interested in doing in any case. So once he knew that that was what Stalin wanted, he sort of made this proposal to Stalin. So I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, that sounds good. These are British soldiers returning. You could see women showing up with bottles of wine uh, at the train station, guys handing out sandwiches. There's a British soldier who's copped a, a Nazi Stahlhelm. And uh, there was a real feeling of relief. As a matter of fact, Montgomery saw guys uh, sort of going around in London, sort of like ebullient about the whole thing, and was like, well, this is terrible. Like, this is a defeat. This isn't a victory. Like, we shouldn't. But there was this feeling that, okay, now, like, we can make a stand. And one of the, I, I forget which associate of, of, of Churchill's was walking around London. So in London, the newsboys, and they would do that do this here too, would have sort of stacks of newspapers, and they'd have a, a, a slate board where they'd write down the headlines and he said he was walking around near Whitehall and he saw one of the one of the newsboys had chalked on his board we we're in the final match to be played on home ground um, it's just sort of like this attitude of defiance we haven't lost you, you have to you have to you have to take us and so I mean this is that sort of final one of the final scenes in the in the Dunkirk movie you can see uh, Tom Hardy the British pilot who spent all day trying to keep Nazi warplanes off the, the soldiers off, on the beaches and off the boats in the channel. He's finally run out of gas and he's managed to crash, his, crash land his plane on the beach Dunkirk and he set it on fire so the Germans wouldn't get it. You could see the German soldiers coming to take him prisoner. And it's this very powerful statement of the, of the British feeling in the wake. You know, here we are, we're alone, but we're going we're gonna to make our stand. And so finally on June 18th, Churchill addresses the House of Commons. I spoke the other day of the colossal military disaster which occurred when the French High Command failed to withdraw the northern armies from Belgium at the moment when they knew that the French front was decisively broken at Sedan and on the Meuse. This delay entailed the loss of 15 or 16 French divisions and threw out of action for the critical period the whole of the British Expeditionary Force. Our army and 120,000 French troops were ordered, uh, were indeed rescued by the British Navy from Dunkirk. Not quite 120,000, but a lot. But only with the loss of their cannon, vehicles, and modern equipment. This loss inevitably took some weeks to repair, and in the first of these two weeks, the Battle for France has been lost. 
When we consider this heroic resistance by the French army against heavy odds in this battle, the enormous losses inflicted upon the enemy, and the evident exhaustion of the enemy, it may well be thought that these 25 divisions of the best trained and best equipped troops might have turned the scale. This is he's explaining why they didn't reintroduce the, the BEF into southern France as they However, General Vagon had to fight without them. Only three British divisions, or their equivalent, were able to stand in the line with their French comrades. They have suffered severely, but they have fought well. We sent every man we could to France as fast as we could re-equip and, trans and transport their formations. I am not reciting these facts for the purpose of recrimination. That I judge to be utterly futile and even harmful. We cannot afford it. I recite them in order to explain why it was we did not have, as we could, not, as we could have had, between 12 and 14 British divisions fighting in the line in this great battle instead of only three. Now I put this aside. I put it on the shelf from which the historians, when they have time, will select their documents to tell the stories. We have to think of the future and not of the past. The speech goes on, but then he, he finishes, and I think it's worth finishing today on this passage. What General Vagon called the Battle of France is over. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned upon us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free and the life of the world may move forward into broad sunlit uplands. Broad sunlit uplands was a, was a phrase that he revered to quite often. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say this was their finest hour. The British went on to stand alone until at least December 1941. Churchill wanted, or Roosevelt wanted to send aid earlier, but couldn't because of a series of neutrality acts passed by isolationist forces in the United States. That all went by the boards when Pearl Harbor happened. Isolationism uh, became a dead issue once after Pearl Harbor. But it wasn't until uh, late 1942 that we really got into the fight there and not until 43 43 is when North Africa happens 43 is the beginning of the for us <laughs> not for the, the British are fighting there before that 43 is when the invasion of Sicily happens and the, the Anzio landing which turned out was another disaster but that's another question um, but why is Dunkirk important? Dunkirk is important because it was the moment that the British really resolved that they were going to make a stand here even if they had to stand alone. You know, Churchill says, when Napoleon waited for a year at Bologna for his flat bottom boats, one of his associates told him, there are bitter weeds in England. Well, there are a lot more bitter weeds here now. And if you think you're going to come over here and, and take us, think again. Dunkirk wasn't a victory, but what it was not was a defeat in a certain sense. What it was, was an incredibly bravely undertaken tactical retreat that allowed the British to stand, that allowed the British to maintain their resistance to Hitler and change the course of the war in ways that are, that are I, I feel like, barely calculable. And I think that's what I have for you. All right, thank you so much for coming out, and uh, we'll see you next time we have historical content.